Did ancient Egyptians use moldy bread as antibiotics and train baboons to catch criminals? Explore the shocking and bizarre practices of ancient Egypt in this eye-opening journey through history. Number one, training baboons to catch criminals. Now, the ancient Egyptians had a thing for animals, especially cats and baboons. They didn't just keep them as pets, they gave them jobs too. But the baboons weren't just hanging around looking cute, they were doing serious work. These furry detectives were trained to catch criminals. Imagine a baboon in a tiny uniform patrolling the streets. They were like the first ever police force, only with more fur and less handcuffs. How did they do it? Well, hieroglyphics and ancient artwork show us that baboons were used to capture lawbreakers. It's like a scene from a wild animal cop show, but for real. But wait, there's more. Baboons in ancient Egypt weren't a one-trick pony, or baboon in this case. They had all sorts of roles. Some helped out in the temples, others were companions to the elite, and a few even dabbled in the mystical arts as divination assistants. Number two, sacrificing and mummifying crocodiles. Now, crocodiles in ancient Egypt weren't just lurking in the water waiting for their next meal. They had a special place in the hearts of the Egyptians. These fierce creatures were seen as sacred, especially to Sobek, the god of water and the Nile's flooding. To honor Sobek and ensure his favor, the Egyptians did something quite extraordinary. They sacrificed crocodiles. Yep, you heard that right. They offered these fearsome reptiles to their god, but it didn't stop there. These crocs weren't just offered up, they were mummified. That's right. They wrapped these crocodiles up like they did with their pharaohs. Now, why on earth would they do this? Well, for ancient Egyptians, the Nile was their lifeblood. Its floods brought fertile soil for crops, making it the source of prosperity. And since crocodiles lived in the Nile, they were seen as protectors of this precious river. Offering them to Sobek was a way to keep the Nile happy and prevent it from going all crazy with floods. Archaeologists have even found these mummified crocodiles, and it's a sight to see. These critters were preserved with care, placed in special tombs and adorned with jewellery. It was like a crocodile spa day, but for the afterlife. Number three, unconventional oral hygiene. In ancient Egypt, folks had some wild ways of keeping their pearly whites clean. They didn't have fancy toothpaste or electric toothbrushes like we do today. Nope, they had their own unique dental routine that might surprise you. Imagine brushing your teeth with pumice, the same stuff you'd use to scrub stubborn stains off your pans. The Egyptians did just that. They'd take a rough stone, pumice, and scrub away at their teeth to get rid of gunk and stains. It might sound harsh, but it did the job. But that's not all. They got even more inventive, Burned eggshells and ground-up bull hooves were on their oral hygiene menu. Yep, you read that right. They'd mix these powders into a paste and use it to brush their teeth. Now, this might seem strange, but eggshells do have calcium, which is good for teeth. And bull hooves? Well, they contain a kind of gelatin, which might have made their paste a bit smoother. While these methods might have worked to some extent, they also had their downsides. The pumice and gritty powders could be pretty abrasive, and over time, they might have worn away the enamel on their teeth. The enamel is like the armor for your teeth, so losing it isn't great. But wait, there's more. They used some natural ingredients like pepper, iris flowers, and rock salt. These weren't just for flavor. They believed these spices helped clean their teeth. Imagine having spicy breath after brushing. And guess what? They even had something similar to our modern toothbrushes. They'd chew on twigs to make bristles, sort of like a DIY toothbrush. Clever, right? Number four, healing wounds with moldy bread. Believe it or not, the ancient Egyptians had a trick up their sleeves when it came to healing wounds, and it involved bread that had seen better days. You see, mold isn't always the bad guy. In this case, it was a hero in disguise. Here's how it worked. When they noticed mold on their bread, which happened often in the humid climate, they didn't toss it out like we do today. Instead, they'd slap that moldy slice right onto their wound. 
Crazy, right? But here's the twist. That mold wasn't just any mold. It was a primitive form of penicillin, the stuff we now use in antibiotics. The mold produced a substance that fought off bacteria like a superhero. It was like having a tiny army of mold soldiers defending your cut. Now, it wasn't perfect. The ancient Egyptians probably didn't understand the science behind it all, but they knew it worked. So, they kept using it for centuries. It wasn't until modern times that we figured out what made it tick and developed our fancy antibiotics. Number five, using bread and beer as currency. Now you might be thinking, why would anyone use bread and beer as money? Well, it's not as crazy as it sounds. You see, bread and beer were the staples of Egyptian life. They were not just food and drink, but also symbols of sustenance and life itself. Here's the deal. Bread was a big deal. It was the primary food source for most Egyptians, from the lowly labourer to the mighty pharaoh. And beer? It wasn't just for kicking back and relaxing, it was a daily necessity. In a world where water wasn't always safe to drink, beer was a crucial source of hydration. Plus, it had some nutritional value, so it kept people going. Now here's where it gets interesting. Egyptians believed that the gods needed to be fed too. So bread and beer weren't just for humans. They were offerings to the gods, like Osiris and Hathor, who watched over Egypt. But here's the twist. These offerings to the gods weren't just spiritual, they were also practical. The priests who managed these offerings often distributed them to the workforce, which included laborers, builders and farmers. So, in a way, bread and beer became a form of payment for the people doing the hard work. Imagine you're a worker on a massive pyramid construction project. You put in your hours, and at the end of the day, you're not handed coins or paper. Nope, you get your share of bread and beer. It was like getting paid in groceries. Number six, shaving eyebrows. After a cat's death. Cats weren't just pets, they were practically royalty. But it gets weirder. When a cat passed away in an Egyptian household, things got hairy, or rather, unhairy. Imagine this. Fluffy the cat, your beloved feline companion, kicks the bucket. Instead of shedding a tear and giving her a proper burial, the ancient Egyptians had a different tradition. Brace yourselves. They shaved off their own eyebrows. Yep, you heard that right. So why on earth did they do this? Well, it all boils down to their deep respect and admiration for these feline friends. In ancient Egypt, cats were associated with the goddess Bastet, who symbolized home, fertility, and childbirth. She was like their cat goddess, and they went to great lengths to honor her. Shaving their eyebrows wasn't just a personal sacrifice. It was a family affair. Everyone in the house got in on it. Imagine a household with everyone sporting bald brows, quite the sight, I'd say. And here's the kicker. They'd keep those eyebrows shaved until they grew back naturally. This morning ritual lasted for days, weeks, or even months, depending on how fast those brows decided to regrow. It was their way of showing grief, not just for their beloved pet, but for the protection and good fortune Bastard brought to their homes. Number seven, bathing in sour milk. Donkey milk might not sound super appealing, but it was believed to work wonders for your skin. Why? Well, it's all about the lactic acid. See, donkey milk has lactic acid, which is also found in today's skincare products. It's like the OG beauty secret. The ancient Egyptians thought lactic acid could help exfoliate their skin and keep it looking fresh. So Cleopatra, one of Egypt's most famous rulers, was rumored to be a fan of these donkey milk baths. It was like her version of a spa day. But here's the thing, donkey milk doesn't come easy. You can't just run to the grocery store and pick up a carton. So back then, only the wealthy and elite could indulge in these lavish baths. For the rest of the folks, it was probably more like a dream. Number eight, belief that the tears of Isis flooded the Nile River. So here's the story. Every year, the Nile would swell and spill over its banks, bringing with it fertile silt that made their crops thrive. This annual flood was crucial for their survival, and they thought it was all thanks to Isis, shedding tears of joy. You see, the ancient Egyptians had a holiday called the Night of Tears, where they celebrated this whole tearful flood thing. 
it was a big deal. Now, fast forward a bit to modern times, and you might be wondering, do people still believe this? Well, not exactly. Most folks today understand the science behind river flooding, and it has nothing to do with divine tears. But there's a twist. Some modern Egyptians still celebrate the Night of Tears, not because they believe Isis is crying, but more as a cultural nod to their ancestors. Number nine, using canopic jars to store vital organs. Ancient Egyptians had a unique way of handling their deceased loved ones. First off, they believed in life after death, and they wanted to make sure the person was all set for the afterlife journey. So, when someone died, they didn't just bury them whole. Instead, they practiced something really cool and kind of creepy at the same time. They used what they called canopic jars. These were special containers, sort of like fancy pots, but with a twist. Inside these jars, they stored some of the dead person's vital organs. Yeah, you heard that right, organs. Now, here's the deal. Egyptians believe that in the afterlife, a person would need their heart, lungs, liver and stomach to stay alive and well. But they couldn't just toss these organs in any old jar. That would be too simple, right? So they had a unique way of doing it. They had four special jars, each with a different lid shaped like one of four gods, Imseti, Hapi, Duamutef and Kebesenuef. These gods were like the guardians of the organs. Imsiti, he had a human head and he watched over the liver. Happy had a baboon head and guarded the lungs. Duamutef, with a jackal head, took care of the stomach. Finally, Kebesa Nuef, the one with a falcon head, looked out for the intestines. They carefully removed these organs, preserving them with special rituals and placed them in their respective canopic jars. It was like a sacred organ storage system. These jars were often buried along with the mummy, making sure the person had everything they needed in the afterlife. Number 10. Pharaoh ruling for 90 years, or 64 years. Meet King Pepi Sika, or as I like to call him, King Pepi the Eternal. Historians have a bit of a debate about how long he actually ruled, but one thing's for sure, it was a very, very long time. Some say he ruled for 90 years. Imagine being in charge for nearly a century. That's like being the boss of your workplace from the time you graduate college till your great-grandkids graduate. Talk about job security. Now don't get too comfortable with that 90-year figure because other historians say it was a mere 64 years. Still impressive, right? In either case, it's a reign that puts modern politicians and leaders to shame. But here's the thing, while it's amazing to think about someone ruling for so long, it's also a bit puzzling. I mean, think about all the ups and downs a kingdom goes through in 90 years, wars, plagues, political drama. Pepi Seku must have had some serious leadership skills or a pretty solid healthcare plan. Speaking of which, there's another side to this story. You see, there's a theory that King Pepi the Seng's reign was so long because he took the throne when he was just a little kid, like a toddler. Imagine a baby ruling a kingdom. So some think that maybe, just maybe, his advisers and regents were running the show while he was still in diapers. In any case, whether it's 90 years or 64, King Pepi the Seku's reign is one for the record books. It's like a history lesson and a puzzling mystery all wrapped up in one. And that's it from this video. Now don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more history content in Antiquio Context.